What a powerful sermon that was from God's Word. I'm thankful, as I was last night, that my family and I were here to hear that. I'm thankful that God used our brother Gavin to instruct us in such a powerful, powerful way this evening. Thankful for everybody that's here. Thankful for the singing. What a great opportunity is. What a blessing to be a Christian. My outline is on the board, so you'll know how far we are. I don't have a PowerPoint tonight. But I do want to talk about these things. I want to talk about this parable of the lost sheep. And I want to talk about two people in particular, Zacchaeus and a woman whose name we don't know. We just know she was a Samaritan woman at a well, but she was a remarkable woman. And I want to talk about the lesson that Jesus taught in his interaction with her and the rest of the people from her city. And then I want to make the application to us. The title of our sermon tonight is Jesus is seeking you. So as Jesus anticipated the approach of his time to die for the sins of the world, he took his disciples on a secret trip through Galilee. And he was teaching them that he would soon be betrayed and killed and that he would rise again the third day. Now in Capernaum, he called the 12 together into a house to reinforce key issues and lessons about the true nature of God's kingdom and about the value of every individual soul. And you can read about this in Matthew chapter 18 and in Mark chapter 9. Now, in response to an argument that they had had among themselves regarding who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus famously called a child to himself, and he told the apostles that in order to enter the kingdom, they would have to humble themselves and become like this little child. They didn't need to worry about who would be closest to Jesus. They needed to be worried about who would even get in. And he said, before you can do that, you've got to be more like this little child. In the teaching that follows, it appears that Jesus alludes back to this by describing believers as little ones throughout. Because in God's sight, all of his little ones are precious and we're citizens of his kingdom. And we must learn to value each individual soul the way that God does. Jesus in this place points to his own mission saying, for the son of man has come to save that which was lost. Matthew 18 and 11. And then he illustrates this truth with a parable about one lost sheep and a loving shepherd. He says in verse 12, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99, and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that one sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. This parable is profound because it emphasizes the value of each individual soul. Jesus is saying he cares about you individually and specifically. He can have 99,000 other sheep, but he wants a relationship with you. The Bible says, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us and that we should be called children of God. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. And that's why God made you and I the way he did. That's why he created us in his image That's why he gave us an everlasting soul. That's why he gave us the ability to have family relationships and the free will to choose because God wants us to choose a relationship with him, a mutually loving relationship. That's why he pursues you the way he does. That's why he's given us evidence of his existence, of his goodness, of his righteousness, and of his love. That's why he became a man. That's why he lived among us and died in our place. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit the apostles and the prophets to deliver and preserve the word of God which lives and abides forever, 1 Peter 1 and 23. That's why he gives us a church family. That's why he hears our prayers and so many other things. And what we need to do is learn to recognize all of these things for what they are. These are reminders that Jesus is seeking you and he's pursuing a relationship with you. Now, I do have to say, sort of as a side note, this relationship comes on his terms. Mentioned last night briefly the importance of defining our terms. So here, everybody talking about their relationship with Jesus Christ. Understand, this is not something we get to make up the terms to. Jesus does, and he wants you in his flock. 
He wants you in the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, Hebrews 12 and 23. And a personal relationship with Jesus can be had, but it can only be had when you are a part of his spiritual family, the church. Now with that, understand this important truth. When we say Jesus is seeking you, the truth is Jesus is seeking everybody. Remember what the Bible says in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9? He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm here to tell you, the Calvinistic doctrines of total depravity, unconditional election and reprobation, and limited atonement are reprehensible doctrines that smear the character of God and ruin the gospel message. They're not true. But if you go to any one of the churches that you passed on your way to this building tonight, the likelihood is if it's an evangelical church, they're teaching those doctrines. And what they're telling people is Jesus came, but Jesus doesn't waste any time or any effort. Everything he does is effectual. It just means effective. And so because in their view, you are so totally depraved, that God had to unconditionally choose certain individuals to be saved and by extension choose that the others would be unconditionally lost because they're reprobate, then unless you're one of those elect, you don't have a chance to go to heaven. And so Jesus wouldn't have wasted his blood by dying for you. He only died for the ones that he had unconditionally elected before time by name for salvation. Isn't that awful? Those aren't the Calvinistic doctrines that are typically emphasized. Church pews in those places would not be nearly so full if they were. But the doctrines of Calvin all come as a package deal. If one of them's true, every one of them is true. If one of them's not true, none of them can be. The Bible affirms that Jesus loves you, my friend. He loves you, and when he died, he died for you. And he died for everybody. He is not willing that any should perish. Now then, with that firmly established, you have to be willing to be found. Okay, did you know that there are documented cases of people who will hide from search and rescue parties when they're about to be found? I don't understand all of the psychology of this, but I suspect it has to do uh, with different things in different cases. Some people are in denial. Maybe it's a dude, and he's like, I'm not lost. So he doesn't want to be embarrassed. He doesn't think he needs the search and rescue team. Maybe it's shame. Sometimes a little child will wander off. This happened to me one time when I was younger in California. I was about nine years old and some of y'all's cousins were there. And I wandered off thinking I was going to be funny. As I snuck around the back and I was going to head him off at the pass until all of a sudden I was lost in the woods. And I could hear voices somewhere, but I wasn't about to call out and tell him I was lost because I was embarrassed. So sometimes kids wander off the path. And maybe their parents told them, don't wander off the path. And so now they're afraid of getting in trouble or they're embarrassed or they're ashamed. And so when search and rescue starts coming, Aubrey, Aubrey, they actually hide. It's hard for us to wrap our mind around that. But it, people routinely do this in a spiritual sense by failing to acknowledge their need to be saved. Jesus came on the greatest rescue mission in human history. And we have to prepare our hearts because Jesus is seeking those who need him. He's seeking the lost and the sick and the hungry and the thirsty. I want you to think about Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 21, Jesus had come back now as a man to his hometown of Nazareth. And Jesus said in one place that a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. And that does happen sometimes. You go back and you try to talk to people who saw you grow up and they remember you and all the foolish behavior you participated in. And so it's, it's hard for them now to see you as a grown-up, somebody that you know, they should, should listen to. And that definitely happened to Jesus when he went back to Nazareth. But on the Sabbath day in the synagogue, I mean, he was one of their friends. He was one of their boys. So they at least gave him an opportunity to stand up and read from the scriptures. That was pretty customary. And this is the verse that Jesus began to read from. It was from Isaiah and uh, in verse 18 of Luke chapter 4, he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, you got to get this. Jesus said that, and they were all sitting on the edge of their seat waiting to hear what 
commentary he would give about this. Other people had read this before. This wasn't the first time they had heard this. They understood that the writer, or uh, Jesus in this case reading it, was speaking, but he was speaking from a, a different perspective, and he was probably about to tell them who was talking. The person who said, I'm the one who the Lord has sent to do all these things, and this is what Jesus does. When he's done, he just closes the book, and he just goes and sits down. And the eyes of everybody are fixed upon Jesus. And he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. And since their eyes were fixed on him, he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus was saying two things. Okay, He was saying, I'm the one who is here to save you. And you are the ones that need to be saved. And it's hard to tell which thing offended them more. But they took Jesus and they intended to cast him off the edge of a cliff because they weren't going to have anybody that they had seen be raised come in here and tell them that he's their savior. And number two, we don't need to be saved. We're not the poor, blind, brokenhearted, miserable wretches. We're Abraham's kids. We know who we are. And this is the tragic experience that Jesus had in his rescue mission is that so often he would come to people and say, I'm here to save you. And they didn't want any part of it because they didn't think they needed saving. So that's why Jesus told us to open the door of our heart to him. In Revelation 3 and verse 20, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. But you have to open your heart and prepare it to be saved. Let's look at two examples now of individuals who did this. And I believe that Jesus had a purpose, as you'll see, for talking to these specific individuals. And more so, I believe that the Holy Spirit had a purpose for saving this record for us so that we could learn from them and make application to our life. I'm actually going to turn to these passages and and read along and make some comments as we go, so you'll have time. I encourage you to do the same thing. The first is in Luke chapter 19. We're going to read several verses there. We're going to read uh, from about verse 1 all the way down to verse 10. I'm going to step away from these, and we're going to read about Zacchaeus. So in verse 1, it says, Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now, real quickly, Jesus didn't do anything on accident. And to understand a little bit about how it looked when people or when Jesus specifically was traveling. Jesus always had a purpose. He was on a mission. But when he was about to go into a town, um, his reputation would precede him. Even before the age of digital communication, other people would be out in the countryside traveling. And there'd be little kids who were fast. And they'd go by Jesus and his party. And they'd be on their way to Jericho anyway. And so they would run ahead of him. And they would tell everybody, Jesus is coming to Jericho. And by the time Jesus got to town, it looked like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And the streets were lined and everybody was there just to try to see Jesus. And so that's what happened to this one man. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Okay, why does the Bible tell us that? Well, Zacchaeus, being a tax collector and a Jew, would have been hated by all of his countrymen. Everybody that knew him had disowned him because by collecting taxes for the Romans, he was viewed now as a traitor. Okay, they still held on to this belief that Jesus, or excuse me, the Messiah was going to come and he was going to throw off the, their Roman overlords and free the Jewish nation uh, to be a, a free physical nation again. And so if you were collecting taxes for the Romans, you were an enemy and you knew better. So they shunned Zacchaeus. It made it worse for him that he was rich. He was good at what he did. He made good money. But many tax collectors were dishonest and they became rich because they would cheat people. They would say, well, you owe me a little bit more. Now, it looks like a little bit later that if Zacchaeus had ever done this before, he had repented because he was very conscientious now, and he wanted to make sure that he didn't cheat anybody, but that didn't matter. He's a rich Jewish tax collector. Everybody believed that he was cheating people, and if they had had an opportunity to meet Zacchaeus in a dark alley, especially since he was short and not a formidable foe, they would have killed him. So here's Zacchaeus, and he's wanting to get a Look at Jesus. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. Verse 4, so he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. Okay? So you get this picture. Everybody's in front of him. He can't get through the crowd. So he just climbs up into a little tree, and he's going to have a perfect vantage point as Jesus walks down Main Street here in Jericho. And when Jesus, verse 5, came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, what? If I was Zacchaeus, I would have fallen out of the tree. 
These men have never met. And Jesus is surrounded by this throng of people. And he looks up and makes eye contact with them and calls him by name. Here's my question in this account. Who was looking for who? Zacchaeus knew who he was looking for, but Jesus, as we said, he didn't do anything by accident. I believe it's going to be very obvious to us as we continue reading that Jesus came there for Zacchaeus specifically and to use him as an object lesson so he could teach the rest of that people in this city a very important lesson. So he looks up and he says, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, They all complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who's a sinner. That's how they said it, by the way. (laughs) So, who is the they? Well, you know, you look at that and you think, oh, it's probably Pharisees, and there may have been some there, but these were just self-righteous Jews. These were people who were not tax collectors. And so, they didn't think they were as bad as Zacchaeus. And so, in their mind, it didn't make sense that Jesus would come and hang out with Zacchaeus. He should have been hanging out with them because they were somehow worthy of his time and of his attention. So, they complain, said, he's a tax collector and he's a sinner. Why is Jesus hanging out with him? But then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, look, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Okay, I'm not as good as um, the writers of The Chosen So I can't write the whole backstory for you here, but here's what I think. I don't think Zacchaeus was telling Jesus, Lord, look how good I am. I think what he was doing is saying, Lord, if I've ever sinned, I'm so sorry. Here's what I'm doing now. I think he was penitent. I think he was trying. That's that's what I see when I read it. And so Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he is also a son of Abraham. So who's Jesus talking to now? He's talking to Zacchaeus, but he's really talking to everybody else. He's listening to Zacchaeus. Everybody else is listening. What's he going to say? Here's this penitent man. And so Jesus says, he also is a son of Abraham. What does he mean by that? Well, maybe two things. Well, he only had one meaning, but you know, sometimes we say things that are, that are full of, of meaning, sort of, um, we might call it a double meaning if you want to, but Jesus was operating on a lot of different levels here. He was saying exactly what needed to be said. And a true son of Abraham, what we learned from the book of Romans, was not somebody who was a physical Jew, but it was somebody who walked in the steps of the faith of Abraham. So at the very least, there's a hint here. Jesus is saying, hey, he's a Jew also, but more than that, here's a man who's ready to be a true spiritual descendant of Abraham. You guys think just because you were born a Jew, you're children of Abraham, but there's actually a deeper truth here. Abraham had faith. And if you want to be a child of Abraham, you've got to have the same faith that he had. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Okay. So if I'm I'm a Jew and I'm standing there and I'm listening to Jesus, I might go, okay, okay, okay. All right. So at least Jesus isn't missing that. We want to make sure you know he's lost, Jesus. But Jesus acknowledges that. He says, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. So I'm a step ahead of you, friends. I know he's lost. But what you don't seem to have connected the dots with is the fact that you are too. And if you would just allow me to, I would save you too. But your own pride has gotten in the way. So when Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost, he was not just referring to Zacchaeus. He was referring to everybody who needs the Savior. I want to look now at John chapter 4. And in this case, there's uh, another interaction that's just very, very powerful. I'm going to start reading in verse 3. In this place, it says, Now he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. I won't draw the map on the board, but I'll just put it this way. Um, Samaria was the quickest way to get where Jesus needed to go. If you wanted to go from Judea to Galilee or Galilee to Judea, you just walked through Samaria. But the Jews hated the Samaritans so much, they would hike over the Jordan River and walk up through the Decapolis and all that wilderness region, and then they would cross back over the Jordan to get to Judea or Samaria, respectively. Okay? They would add probably days to their trip. But Jesus didn't do that. He not only wanted to go through Samaria, he needed to go through Samaria. So keep that locked in your brain for a minute. Jesus didn't do anything on accident. There was something profound that was about to happen. So... He came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. 
I'm sure there's something profound about this happening at Jacob's well. I just don't know what it was. But I know this, this whole idea of who are Abraham's kids, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is one of several historical locations that would have been a really perfect backdrop for this lesson that Jesus was going to teach to this lady and to her town. She wanted to know, you know, how are we supposed to worship the Lord and all that. So he stops by this well. And being wearied from his journey, he sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. The gospel writers sometimes use Roman time and sometimes Jewish time. I think it's most likely here that it's Jewish time, so I believe this was noon. If it was Roman time and it was 6 p.m., um, the point is this was not the normal time when someone would come to draw water. And so a woman of Samaria came to draw water in verse 7. So high noon, the hottest part of the day, and here's this woman, this woman coming by herself to draw water at this well. And uh, as I've said, we learn from ancient historians and also other Bible verses. This was not the normal time. In Genesis chapter 24, in verse 11, it mentions a group of people coming in the cool part of the day. And so this is the first indication that this woman that Jesus is talking to is probably a social outcast. Because why else would you come by yourself? It was dangerous and it was hot. If she had any friends in that town, she would have come with them. It was for safety and it was for company, but she didn't have one friend who would walk down to the well with her to get water. So <clears throat> Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Unfortunately, sometimes when we read the matter-of-fact Bible narrative, uh, we might miss the, uh, well, the tone of voice we might not understand, why is, he, why is he being so direct? Why didn't he say, please? I mean, if I had said that, my mom would have said, boy, say please. But he says, give me a drink. I don't think Jesus was being rude. I don't think he was being too direct. I think what Jesus was doing is making a connection with that woman. What does it say about somebody? Uh, think, think back to the, to the not too distant past in our country, in the South. Think about race relations. And uh, think about what it meant when Mr. Rogers was on his porch and he put his bare feet in that pool of water with that black man who put his feet in that same pool of water. And think about the ripples and the waves that that caused because I'm not, I have a different color skin as you. I'm not going to touch the same thing you touch. I'm not going to put my feet in the same water you put them in. I'm not going to worship in the same building you worship in. I'm sure ain't going to drink out of one cup with you in the communion. And I'm not going to take a cup of water from you. I would not stoop to that level. That's the kind of mentality and attitude that some people had about people that were different from them. But for Jesus to stop at this well and speak to this woman who was a Samaritan and say, give me a drink of water. He was saying to her, I would accept that act of kindness and that service from you. I believe Jesus, by taking this cup of water from her, was acknowledging her dignity and her value. So he says, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So she understood that this seemed a little out of place. But then Jesus gets to the real reason for his visit. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, do you remember back in verse 4 when it said that Jesus needed to go through Samaria? Why did he need to do that? Well, I believe it was because of this. There were people there in Samaria who needed living water, the water that would lead to everlasting life. In fact, there was one woman in particular who was thirsty for that living water. And this woman certainly was, although she didn't immediately apprehend his meaning and she had to ask a few more questions, there's no doubt that this was a woman who would come to understand the value of this living water. So she says to him, verse 11, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. 
So many times Jesus had conversations with people and he was really operating on a spiritual level and they didn't always get it at the beginning and sometimes part through the conversation they would realize and I think that's what's happening here. Jesus is saying this living water that I'm talking about, I'm talking about everlasting life. I'm talking about something that goes beyond just the physical. And so some people, has it ever occurred to you that some people are so comfortable in this life that they wouldn't possibly see the value of something like that? Why do I need to talk about comfort in the afterlife if I'm so set here? This woman, due to her circumstance and her troubles, she was a person who would see the value of the everlasting life that Jesus offered. And so she said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. And then Jesus said something that seems kind of strange at this point. So she's She's eating this up. She's not there yet. She's still talking about drawing from this well. But then he shifts gears and he says, go call your husband and come here. Again, another one of those points where you might think Jesus is just being very direct or maybe even cruel. Why do you suppose Jesus gave her that directive? Well, as sincere as this woman was, she had sin in her life that needed to be confronted. And I think that Jesus asked her this question to force her to confront a sin in her life. Receiving the gift of salvation from sin requires that you acknowledge your sin. Why do we call it the gospel? The gospel of Jesus Christ more specifically. The good news of Jesus Christ is that you can be saved from your sin. What sin? A lot of people may ask. And so the doctrine of God's righteousness and his holiness and what sin is, is so important for us to contemplate because first of all, a person has to see sin the same way that God does and acknowledge it so that they can then look at this news about Jesus who became a man and died for our sins as the greatest news in the world. So we can't just skip over the teaching on sin. There's got to be conviction. There's got to be repentance. And so Jesus asks this question. He starts this line of questioning to get this woman to do just that. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have said, well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you have now is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. I'm going to confess that I used to read this, and I just assumed, well, this was a promiscuous woman. Don't we assume things about people? I'm not convinced of that anymore. I'm not saying she was justified in her current relationship. That's something that she needed to repent of. But consideration of her possible circumstance may lead to some much-needed sympathy as we think about this woman and the lesson that she teaches us. You know, it occurs to me, based on what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 24, that this woman may have been put away by multiple husbands If you go back and read, I'm not going to do it right now, but in Deuteronomy chapter 25, there are five different cases of immorality where the man and or the woman would be punished, okay? And those included death in some cases, in other cases, something else. Then you get over to Deuteronomy chapter 24, and it says there that if a man, I'm just going to read it, Deuteronomy chapter 24. A man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her. Now, real quick, some people assume that that uncleanness is like premarital uh, immorality or something like that. But what you got to understand is this is distinct from that exact case over in Deuteronomy chapter 22. This is talking about something different because the um, way that they handled it is different. This will make you... Have some sympathy for the ladies who lived back in this time. So if he found someone cleanness in her, he can write her a certificate of divorce. He can put it into her hand and send her out of his house. And uh, when she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, you couldn't do that if this was sexual immorality. You were put to death. But she could go and become another man's wife. But if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies, who took her as his wife, then the former husband who divorced her, may not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled. Did she defile anybody? No, she had been defiled. So you got all these guys that think they want to marry this woman, and then they find something about her that they don't like. She's just not pleasing, and so they put her away. And so she goes, and she can marry the next man, but if he puts her away, she can't ever go back to one of the same ones she's had before. Her options kind of start running out. I don't know if this was the case, but I suppose something like this could have happened multiple times to this woman. 
Maybe one of her husbands put her away. Maybe the next husband put her away. Maybe one of them died. Maybe she had been with multiple men. And now, at this point, she had taken up with some worthless man who wasn't even good enough to marry her. We don't know exactly what happened. All that we know is that she had had multiple husbands, but the one that she had now was not her husband. I want you to imagine what something like this might do to this woman's sense of self-worth. She may, like I said, have attached her to some man hoping that his approval would bring her the sense of belonging and value that she so desperately desired when all of these other men had rejected her. And this is why it's so important to understand that our identity is in Christ. And there's young people here. I know why you're here, right? I know why you come to meetings, right? No, it's a, it's a good thing. You're here to be built up and to hear the word of God but we form relationships, and some of us are looking, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's great. But you first of all have to establish the fact that you are a child of God. And if, if you're waiting and you think that the only way I can really, you know, come into my own and be the person I need to be is if I find some person, then that's, that's not the case. Good preachers and good husbands and fathers and mothers will say to their young children who are about to get, or to their children who are about to get married having a successful marriage depends not just upon finding the right spouse but on being the right spouse and so you need to prepare yourself to be the kind of godly person that will be a good spouse one day and if it's your lot in life to remain single that's okay because you're a child of god so that's an important lesson that comes from this too sometimes uh, we do things uh, that we ought not do when we forget that lesson so this woman it had a hard life. And regardless of how much she was to blame or how much her situation was to blame, she certainly bore the responsibility for her decisions. But uh, she would have been perceived by people in her town as a woman of ill repute. Most of the people didn't take the time to stop and get to know her and ask these questions of her and figure out why she had fallen on hard times. They just wouldn't walk with her to the well. Okay? Keep that in mind. Think about how awfully these people had treated her. Think about the people who wanted to be her friend and they'd kind of you know, make eye contact with her when they saw her walk into the well, but then they would look back over their shoulder to see who was looking, and they, they wanted to make sure it didn't rub off on them because if they hung out with that woman, it would tarnish their reputation. Think about the way these people had treated her. And you're going you're gonna to be more impressed with this woman when you see how she reacts to all this here in just a minute. But Jesus says, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, verse 19, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. What does that mean? They're gonna, these are people that are going to worship him in, in truth. Did you know that when we offer spiritual sacrifices of praise today to God, that's worshiping God in truth? And all those things that may have seemed a little bit more tangible in the Old Testament, those were just types, and those are just shadows. What we're doing now is the real thing. And so in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24, it describes our worship as the true. And in 1 Peter 2 and verse 40, uh, 20 and 5, 1 Peter 2 and verse 5, it says we're offering spiritual sacrifices. In Romans 7 and verse 6, it says we serve in the spirit. And Jesus is telling her there's going to come a day when the place that you have to worship is not the thing. It's the type of worship that you offer. It has to be true spiritual worship to God. And let me tell you, the Father is seeking such to worship him. Jew, Samaritan, whoever you are, these are the type of people God is seeking to worship him. Why did Jesus need to go to Samaria? Because there was a person like that there. There was this woman. And in finding her, he was able to share the truth with her. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And then look at what this woman did. She goes back to that town where people wouldn't have anything to do with her, and she immediately tells them that she has found the Messiah. This is the type of person Jesus is looking for. We have all these examples in the Scripture of people who found Jesus, and then they went and they told their family and their friends, I found him. 
I found the Messiah. They would bring other people to Jesus. And that's exactly the kind of person that Jesus found here. So she goes back to town. And in verse 29, she says, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. This is a hallmark of people who have been given new hope in Christ. They bring others to Christ. And many of the Samaritans, verse 39 of that city, believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. But then get this, they came to Jesus, they got to hear him for themselves because of his own word, verse 41, and then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him. Isn't that amazing? That God used this outcast from society to convert so many people in that village and bring them to Christ. I love that story of the woman at the well. Now these were not the only people that Jesus ever interacted with or that he saved, but these two, this tax collector and this woman of ill repute, illustrate a principle that Jesus explicitly taught. If you want to, you can turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 28, Jesus tells another parable of two sons. He says, but what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. Okay? Okay. Not going to do it, Dad. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And then all the hands go up. All these religious people that he's talking to, they said to him, the first. And if that interaction had ended right there, they would have been very pleased with themselves. Right? But then Jesus did what he always did and explained to them, this parable is about you. So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Jesus was not saying that harlotry was okay or that the dishonest practices of many tax collectors were okay. He's saying, that's wrong, but they repented. When they learned the truth, they understood that they were poor, brokenhearted, blind, thirsty sinners in need of a Savior. You didn't. And then even afterwards, when you saw them repenting, you still wouldn't repent. And that's why they enter the kingdom of God before you. So these two people that we talked about tonight are two who realized they were lost And they needed to be found. They were sick and they needed someone to heal their soul. They were hungry and thirsty for righteousness and they needed someone to give them the bread and water of life. And Jesus found them. And when he did, they didn't turn away or delay. They didn't wallow in self-pity thinking, oh Lord, you couldn't possibly save me. They surrendered their will to his. And today, if you're not a Christian, then at this moment, you are a lost and a straying sheep. And you need to recognize that. When Jesus seeks you, it's not going to be a better felt than told experience. It's going to probably sound something like this. Somebody doing their best to preach or teach God's word. Are you reading or studying your Bible and praying? He's going to knock on the door of your heart. and He's going to say, I'm here. I've always been here. I've never been far. That's what the Bible says in Acts chapter 17. And when that happens, I'm not talking about some still small voice. Don't get me wrong. Reach out to him. Listen to his voice in scripture. Do whatever he says, trusting in him to save you. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. And Jesus said, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins, John 8, 24. But whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10 and 32. And so go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 15 and 16. If you are a Christian, you've been found. Don't become self-righteous like the Pharisees and think that your sins aren't as bad and that you don't need a savior, maybe like other people do. Don't take your inheritance for granted. Remember that you were lost, but Jesus came, and he found you. And there was so much rejoicing when you were saved. And he wants you to stay safe in his flock, and he's still pursuing you to strengthen that relationship. Get this, if you move away from him, the Bible says if you continue to do that, and you don't listen to his overtures, 
then he will eventually give you up and give you over to a debased mind, Romans chapter 1. Now, it's clear that his ultimate goal is not that you'll just remain lost, but apparently so that you will hit rock bottom and realize your need for him and hopefully come back. And if that happens, we're praying that God will grant you repentance so that you may know the truth and you may come to your senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 25 and 26. And through his prophet, Zechariah, the Lord says, Return to me, and I will return to you. As long as you have breath left in your body, and as long as the Lord delays his coming, because he wants everybody to be saved, you will have an opportunity to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, or if you're a Christian, to make your life right. We just don't know how long that is. And so we would encourage you to not delay. In fact, we're about to stand up and sing a song, and we're going to give you an opportunity then to come forward and and let us know what your desires are. And it would thrill our soul and humble our hearts, and we would feel privileged to assist you in your obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ tonight. Or if you are a Christian in need of uh, repentance and confession in the prayers of the church, to assist you in that way as well. If you'll let us know while we come, stand and sing.